So um, I want to talk about the uh, possible role of uh, the normative idea uh, of personal moral desert, the role that it might play in human rights. But first I need to say just a little bit about human rights. So the first three slides, I think, will be about human rights. So um, for my purposes, uh, uh, we can just focus on three things uh, about human rights. First, that they're universal. And so if we, ex I could, we could explain that, although I think this is actually a little too strong, uh, by saying that if a right, R, uh, is a human right, then every person is a right holder, that is, the person who possesses the right, uh, of that right are. Uh, so everybody, uh, all human persons are right holders. They, they, they possess the right. Uh, the second part is that uh, human rights are moral uh, and or uh, legal rights. You could have some legal rights, legal human rights that are not moral rights, and presumably there are lots of moral rights that aren't legal human rights. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we have this core, perhaps, where they overlap. Um, and then thirdly, and I think this is an essential feature of human rights, uh, and that is that it's not, there, there isn't just one. They're plural. We always say rights. <laughs> uh, they're plural. Uh, and indeed, they come in lists. And this, perhaps, is the legacy of the Bill of Rights tradition on which the United Nations uh, drew in 1948 when it when, when the Universal Declaration was offered, authored. Uh, if we look at the human rights that we find in law, I always divide them into seven families. Uh, I don't like these, these, this distinction between, this big distinction between civil and political and economic and social. I'd rather do it in this way. So uh, just quickly uh, look at it. Security rights, due process rights, the fundamental freedoms, things like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, freedom of movement, uh, rights of political participation, uh, equality rights that guarantee equal citizenship, uh, equality before the law, non-discrimination, uh, economic and social rights uh, that invo you know, involve things like subsistence, health care, education, more than that, actually. Um, and then uh, uh, this, the seventh family isn't in the Universal Declaration, but we find it in a lot of the treaties that the UN has done subse subsequently, uh, beginning uh, with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and then we get CEDAW, the Women's Convention, and we've gotten a whole bunch of others uh, as well. Uh, so those are the seven families. And <coughs> This clearly suggests that human rights are pretty diverse and that they seem to represent a whole bunch of different human interests or values. Uh, that that uh, if we just looked at this at face value, it would suggest pluralism. It would suggest that there's a bunch of values at work here, uh, not just a single one. Now, of course, there are philosophers who uh, scramble hard to try to find a single value here. Uh, 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 I guess we could follow Ronald Dwork Dworkin in calling them hedgehogs, uh, <laughs> uh, meaning that they look for one big thing, one grand idea that will explain all this diversity. Uh, I myself am, uh, in that framework, a, 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 a fox, not a hedgehog. Uh, I look for many things. <laughs> uh, and so uh, uh, I respond to this by thinking, well, we have to have some, uh, some various grounds of human rights, because after all, look what we've got here. We've got some pretty distinct values. Uh, security, uh, we've got the fundamental freedoms, and security and fundamental freedoms often conflict, and it seemed to involve different stuff. Uh, we've got the sort of participatory rights stuff. Uh, uh, then we get this whole, you know, before we had a freedom dimension, a security dimension, a freedom dimension. Now in five, we get an equality dimension. Uh, and in six, we get a kind of welfare dimension. Uh, I sometimes refer to that as the conditions of a minimally good life, right? So that looks pretty varied in terms of what's in the list. So now that, uh, you know, in, in the 60-some years that we've had, uh, in 60-some in, uh, years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, we, um, 
we've seen human rights become a kind of international normative framework. It doesn't rule the world, it isn't accepted everywhere, but it is certainly a, a very dominant uh, normative framework. Uh, and uh, for those of us who care about philosophy, uh, that's work to be done. It provides, because there, there, there are various jobs, and one job, which is the one I was just kind of discussing, is uh, how human rights relate to various moral concepts that we might think as shaping them or being the underlying moral concepts. So the question is which moral concepts play a role in the justification and operation of human rights and which ones don't. Um, and I suppose we could explore that in two ways. One is that we could view it as a kind of factual question, a historical question. What sorts of values were the people who, who wrote the Universal Declaration guided by? That would be a sort of historical question and there are some nice books that try to answer that. Uh, but another question would be kind of reconstructive. If we were doing a kind of normative reconstruction of the best grounds for human rights, what would we say? And that's a more theoretical, less historical project. Uh, and uh, I'm actually interested in both. And we can talk about that as we go along. Okay, so now I want to turn to personal moral desserts. Uh, what's the word in Italian for this? Merito. Merito, yeah, so merit. Yeah, we would say the same thing in English. We could talk about a person's merit, uh, their moral merit. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so here are some examples. Uh, uh, Abe, that's actually my late brother-in-law. He was such a good guy. I used him as an example uh, of someone who had a high level of moral virtue that he displayed over many decades. Uh, or... Uh, uh, Someone may deserve gratitude. So Juanita may deserve gratitude from Carolina for concern, emotional support, and assistance during Carolina's recent battle with cancer. So there it would be that she deserves some kind of thanks, maybe a gift. Uh, and it's probably obligatory uh, that that debt of gratitude be paid from a moral perspective, even though it's not a big deal in terms of welfare. Uh, also, uh, here I'm thinking of, uh, uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, uh, the big fraudster in the United States who defrauded millions of people, uh, uh, Madoff. Ma yeah, Madoff, Ber Bernard Madoff, yeah. So he may deserve legal punishment for the financial fraud that he recently perpetrated. Uh, then there's the case of innocence. Uh, if Paul didn't steal Fred's motorcycle, then he should not be punished for the theft because such punishment would be disproportionate to his innocence. Uh, I think that if, you, if we're going to assign, assign a quantity to someone's dessert, uh, then we'll need to take the quantity zero into account as well. And so this is a case where the dessert basis is zero. Um, I also want to emphasize that sometimes uh, moral desserts just give you permission to do something. They don't obligate you to do it. So if Henry is very rude to Irma, uh, uh, she has permission, but not an obligation, to talk back, to say, that's very rude of you. Uh, apologize. You were very wrong. <laughs> uh, and so that's a case of getting a permission. So those are just some examples of the kind of things that I have in mind when we're thinking about personal moral desserts. Uh, if we wanted to try to explain it, we could use this schema. So we've got two people, P1 and P2. Uh, T is the treatment that P2 gives to P1. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, uh, that treatment is given in virtue of having some dessert basis, of having done something that is the basis for the claim about dessert. So person one deserves treatment from person two in virtue of having a certain dessert basis. Those are the four elements uh, in this relation. And the dessert relation, the idea of desserts, puts those four elements together and uh, applies it in particular cases. Uh, usually when we're looking uh, at dessert, we'll find some kind of claim of proportionality, that some treatment would be proportional or appropriate uh, uh, in light of the dessert basis. And so if we go back to the example of Carolina's debt 
to Juanita for emotional support, well, we'd have to ask, well, what would be an appropriate response? Uh, what, what sort of size of response? Maybe a small gift, uh, a big thank you, <laughs> right? Um, and so we'll, uh, and, and this, of course, is what makes dessert messy, because there's always going to have to be the operation of judgment in trying to balance the two things in balancing the treatment to the dessert basis. Uh, and I want to be very modest, or I want to suggest that, uh, or indeed I want to emphasize the difficulty in dealing with dessert. It's not easy. Uh, uh, we would perhaps have to be much better moral beings than we are to really do it very well, but with our limited human capacities, we try to assess this proportionality. Um, so then the question is, well, this, uh, we've got this idea of personal moral desert. Uh, does it play any role in the realm of human rights? And I was actually uh, stimulated to write this paper because James Griffin assigned it such a very tiny role. And that got me to thinking, well, is that really, isn't there more than that? And we'll come to that in a minute. But if you had asked me the question, uh, what's the role of personal desserts in the realm of human rights, five years ago, I would have said none. Uh, human rights are universal, uh, whereas uh, people's desserts are variable. Uh, and so how can we account for the universality of human rights with something that's variable? That's the puzzle. Uh, and so the worry about dessert-based dessert rights is that they cannot satisfy the condition. So uh, I want to talk about four roles uh, that desserts could play uh, in relation to human rights. And I'll try to explain four different things that they could do. The first one is not that they do anything for human rights, but that human rights need to limit them because they're dangerous. Because after all, we have strong views about, about what people deserve, uh, you know, that we may think that someone deserves to die <laughs> or maybe deserves to, to be tortured and then die, <laughs> given what the horrible thing that the person has done. And so human rights would certainly need to impose constraints on that sort of thing, right? So that would be just a kind of, uh, it's not that human, that desert, personal desserts do anything for human rights, but human rights have a role in relation to them, namely constraining them. And actually, that'll be part of my story. Uh, then there's uh, Griffin's answer, and it, it, he said he only applies it to economic and social rights. He talk, he's talking about uh, qualifying for an organ transplant, and uh, he says, well, if there's, uh, if, if there's only one organ, and if there are two people, one who perhaps has uh, lived uh, a horrible life, has been a criminal, a doper, uh, and another person who's been upright, we might say it isn't fair to give it to the criminal. Right? We say we should give it to the other. Uh, that, he, he says, okay, it could work as a tiebreaker, but that's as far as he's prepared to go. Um, so that's two. Uh, the, um, the third one is that perhaps personal desserts sometimes impose qualifications on human rights, uh, and that is that they actually limit the applicability of a human right to a person. Uh, and uh, when I started looking at the, uh, 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 at the standard lists of human rights to see whether there was any evidence that dessert was playing a role, uh, there I found quite a lot. Um, because, uh, for example, take the freedom of movement. That's a human right, the right to freedom of movement, also the right to freedom of residence. Uh, and yet if you're serving a prison term for a crime, uh, for which you were justly convicted, uh, then uh, it's, it's right that you, shouldn't that you shouldn't be able to exercise those rights during the period that you're in prison, and perhaps also later when you are on parole. Uh, so that would be an example. Uh, and, and notice what that does. It just chops an exception into the right to freedom of movement, right? An exception or a qualification. Uh, uh, another one would be uh, uh, in terms of uh, using the right uh, to have access to public service, that is, being a public official. 
And that doesn't mean uh, that every, everyone, all of us get to be a public official for 15 minutes. What it means is that uh, uh, within some kind of fair process, people should be able to compete uh, for political office uh, and then serve. Um, I think I was especially or interested in this because when I first got to Miami seven years ago, uh, I think all f uh, out of the five city commissioners, four had been indicted for corruption. <laughs> And they asked the governor to sort of deal with it. And he said, no, I'm not touching that one. You figure it out. Uh, and so uh, uh, if, if someone has been uh, uh, justly convicted of corruption, then we might think that they no longer are qualified to, uh, s to serve in public office. Uh, and it isn't, in the, in, in the former case, you could say, well, you know, it's just that people in, are in, have to be in prison, and it's kind of a consequence of that, uh, that they can't exercise their rights of freedom of movement, but that's the only reason. But here, uh, I mean, suppose, uh, I don't know if you saw this in the paper, suppose that someone uh, uh, was in that position, they had been elected to political office and then convicted of corruption, and they were now in jail, and they say, oh, I still wanna be a city commissioner, uh, just get me my phone and my computer and a video link and I can continue to serve. And we would say, no, even if you could, we, should, we wouldn't let you, right? So if you're persuaded, then this would be a, you're kind of accepting the idea that uh, dessert imposes restrictions on the right to serve in public office. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, those are a couple uh, of uh, examples of the way in which uh, considerations of personal desert could restrict or limit human rights. And here's, so how does it go in terms of that previous analysis? Well, uh, the desert basis is, say, having been justly convicted of corruption while in public office. Uh, and then we think that an appropriate response to that is that we have permission to forbid them to continue in, political, uh, in public office. Or maybe we even have a duty to, but it would be at least one of those. Uh, okay, so that's uh, uh, one thing we could say. Uh, we could say that they play a negative role. Another question though is, uh, could they play, uh, this is my fourth, uh, could they play a positive role? Uh, could they actually contribute something to the justification of human rights rather than just limiting them? Um, and again, I looked around and it looked, uh, and it seemed that I uh, could find uh, some examples uh, of those. So uh, first there's the right of the innocent against punishment. And so if you're innocent, uh, your desert basis uh, in relation to uh, having done of any of the things that would qualify for criminal punishment uh, is zero, right? Uh, you don't have any uh, 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 basis for being uh, uh, punished. And so it looks as though we could get something that you find in many hum human rights documents, and that is uh, uh, a prohibition of punishing the innocent. Uh, that may seem too obvious, but often uh, it's tempting to punish the innocent, perhaps because we're punishing an entire group, or because it would be efficient uh, if we were to, in terms of deterrence, if we were to impose punishments on someone who is innocent. Uh, also, uh, there's the right against grossly disproportionate punishments. And here, when I saw that disproportionate, I thought, bingo, right? That sounds like dessert. Uh, it sounds as though uh, we have really got, uh, uh, and again, it's hard to know exactly what the appropriate punishment is, but we could say that some forms of, of punishment would be grossly disproportionate, and we have a human right against that. Uh, due process rights, which are things like a right to a fair trial, the right to assistance of counsel, those sorts of rights actually help us prevent the first two and so we could say that perhaps considerations of dirt uh, or, or that there's a kind of instrumental collect connection between due process rights and these dessert-based things that we find in the first two. Um, 
I also um, uh, floated the idea that uh, perhaps there's a dessert basis for the right to compensation for violations of human rights. Uh, and uh, I think that's perhaps the, uh, the dodgiest of my examples, uh, but it's there. Uh, then one that's pretty strong is the right to fair wages and equal pay for, for work, uh, where it says that uh, uh, if you work, uh, uh, if you work for an employer, then you have a right to fair wages and equal pay, and that could be both uh, uh, horizontal in relation to uh, say, pay uh, for men and women, uh, or it could, be, uh, it could be vertical in relation to uh, 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 comparing myself with others who are higher paid or lower paid. Uh, and then there's the right to, comp uh, uh, another one that we find in the Universal Declaration is the right to compensation for creative work. That is, that if you have created some kind of book or artwork, you have some kind of claim to compensation. It's very vague, but again, it sounds like uh, a, uh, uh, something that might be based on personal dessert. So those were the, uh, the examples that I dragged in to try to make this persuasive. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, again, what I was doing was looking at various rights that we find in the Universal Declaration and other human rights documents, and then saying, are there any that look like they might involve personal desert? Uh, and even if you disagree, I think this is kind of interesting, uh, and it needs some kind of explanation. Um, uh, and uh, there's this nice response to my paper, I don't know if you looked at it, by Sophia uh, Stemplowski, uh, no, Stemplowska, who's uh, in the politics department at Oxford, and she wrote a nice response to my paper. I'll show you uh, what she wrote in a little bit. Okay. So, let's think about this. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we've got this issue about universality that's the biggest objection to letting dessert play a role in human rights. And in, uh, so first think about what I was calling the negative role, where it, or, or the limiting role, where it, where it sort of imposes uh, or cuts exceptions into certain human rights. Um, I say that that isn't so unusual uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, there are lots of ways in which uh, rights don't necessarily apply to everyone. Uh, if you think about uh, uh, some, uh, most rights uh, will only apply to a person if they uh, both accept them and activate them. So you, they're the right holder, but they won't activate the right or they won't accept the use of the right or they won't employ the right, uh, and so uh, the right isn't present in their case. Other rights only apply on the basis of need, so medical care, for example, or uh, uh, applies on the basis of need, and so although everyone has that right, it's only those who are ill who actually get to activate it. Uh, and, uh, another one would be vulnerability. Uh, it's only the people who, uh, everyone has the right to due process of law, but it's only the people who are charged with a crime that get to activate that right. So we might say it's the same thing uh, with those who have their rights limited because they committed crimes. Uh, 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 that uh, as we move closer to the application stage, we move away from this sort of very global conception of universality and move towards something that's more qualified. And it's not as though that kind of a qualification is unheard of. Um, in regard to the positive role, uh, it doesn't seem to me that uh, this was the worry that I sketched before about how could we explain something universal uh, when, uh, in terms of dessert, when dessert is variable. Some people deserve a lot, some per people deserve a little. Uh, some people have positive dessert, other people have negative dessert. Uh, how could we do that? Well, uh, I think the, uh, the best explanation is that personal desserts are not like, say, the right to food, where you're simply entitled to a good if you need it. Uh, they rather say uh, that you're 
entitled to some proportional, so, some proportion of something if you satisfy the dessert basis. Right, so it's a, it, it's a right to something that varies with what you are like. And maybe the clear, clearest case of that is the right to employment. And so, uh, unlike the right to food, the right to, uh, to employment uh, is conditional. It's conditional both on your uh, having a job, it only applies when you're getting wages, uh, and uh, it then says uh, that the wages that you get ought to be fair in relation to your contribution. Right, so it's a universal right to something that varies in accordance with what you do. And it seems to me that it's that pattern that makes it possible for people to have universal rights to variable things. Uh, we find something like that in other areas. Uh, you can have universal rights on the basis of variable needs, right? And so a person who has huge health problems will, uh, will sort of uh, uh, demand and get much, a much larger system, under the, uh, a much larger response under the right to health care. Uh, Okay, so that gets me to the conclusion, uh, uh, just to uh, remind you of all this. Uh, so uh, I suggested that considerations of personal dessert can and do play a significant but modest role in the realm of human rights. That, that was the claim. Uh, they both justify uh, quali qualifications and limits to rights, and they provide justifications for rights. Uh, protections uh, where that needs to be uh, proportionate. Um, and so, um, if, if any of this is right, then uh, when we engage in human rights theory, uh, theorizing, we need to at least say why we're going to reject any role for, for personal dessert. Uh, that's uh, my rather modest conclusion uh, but I was meaning what, mainly wanting to kind of raise this as an issue, to say, theorists, think about this. Uh, maybe uh, there's a more of a case for a dessert basis for some human rights than you realize. Uh, finally, uh, there's this nice uh, critical essay uh, by uh, Zemplowska uh, that uh, makes the following points. This is just a quote from her conclusion. Um, this essay and her response is one of the essays in a book that just came out from Oxford. Uh, it's edited by Rowan Cruft and several others, and it's called, I think, Philosophical Foundations of Human Rights. I think that's the name of it. Uh, and so they got uh, Sophia to write a critique of my essay, and uh, so she suggests that uh, the things I, uh, the examples I offer uh, can be explained without invoking dessert. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical of that, but uh, she gives it a good try. Uh, and uh, also she thinks that allowing dessert to qualify or justify human rights, those are my two things, uh, would weaken human rights uh, and uh, it would not deliver anything essential to make sense of our moral landscape. So there's just a little survey, a, a little summary uh, of the paper I wrote, and I hope you found it, you found it interesting. Thank you.